It's the first Australian Grand Prix in three years. Charles Leclerc dominates. Max Verstappen suffers more reliability issues. And Danny Rick brings it home in six for his home Grand Prix. G'day there. My name is James Baldwin and welcome to another episode of Lakeside Drive's F1 podcast. In this episode, we review the Australian Grand Prix. And I'm joined, as always, by my friends and yours in person, Tommy T. G'day, mate. How you doing? Doing very well. And not in person, Freya. How are you, mate? Uh, yeah. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. No idea. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> doing all right. It's pretty much though. all of those time zones for you. That's what, uh, that's what yeah. it is. Uh, look, it's great to have you joining us. Uh, it's very unfortunately, uh, Campy had to pull out of the last minute uh, today. So it's been a bit of an issue uh, for him. Uh, it's a bit sad that he's not here, but clearly his commitment is lacking to this podcast. Uh, but that's okay because Freya is joining us from Cayman and it is two o'clock in the morning. I have to point that out. So a massive effort for her. But as she just said before we started recording TT, my, my, how the turntables. <laughs> <laughs> It's well about time that we get a good <laughs> race, a good a good time for us, Tommy T. One uh, of. Look, before we start talking about the race itself, uh, TT, you and I and Campy caught up with some wonderful people on Friday night, didn't we? We did. We went to the Coppersmith and we were all sitting there wondering if anyone was actually going to turn up. <laughs> we actually gave a shit about who we were. Uh, and it turns out there's a few of you. So thank you so much if you did come out and say hi. Um, it was definitely as weird for us as it might have been for you. <laughs> as a few of you mentioned... It was a, a weird <laughs> feeling, but no, it was very much appreciated um, and, and nice to actually meet people who care about what we say. And it's not just us talking into the abyss and being useless <laughs> and hanging out, but someone's actually listening, which is a nice feeling. I, lo- I love nothing better than just talking into the abyss. I don't know about you. <laughs> Uh, Freya, we obviously, uh, we missed you there as well. And Manus was there. Not that he probably remembers that he was there, but he was there as well. Uh, but no, it was fantastic. <laughs> fantastic to have uh, you guys there. So thank you to you if you came along. Uh, if you did, got a little bit of a thank you. Please DM our Instagram channel or uh, me on um, Discord and we'll sneak you a little discount on our merch that you can either use uh, for now or whenever Tommy T and gets don't around to designing Don't say you turned up and more. you didn't. Like, no, we'll know. It- well, no, it's uh, it's also a test there of trust, that many. probably. <laughs> Freya's not getting a discount. No. Nah. Uh, also, thank you to you. If you've left us a rating or review recently, uh, it has been overwhelming. I can now say that we are the highest rated Australian F1 podcast in Australia. Don't know about the rest of the world, probably not. Uh, but here... So all that matters is Australia and probably the Cayman Islands, actually. Yeah. Uh, so a massive shout out to you uh, if you've done that. Thank you to Feed for listening. It is incredible, genuinely incredible how many people we are getting listening to this show and we really super appreciate your support, that is for sure, um, including Nobby's Man from Apple Podcasts uh, who has left us a five-star review as well. Um, uh, he also asks in this, uh, and then there's James, uh, is there anything he doesn't know? Well, yes, but you just need to listen to the podcast to find that out. <laughs> so I'm glad that you answered your own question in the reviews. Very, very good indeed. Uh, okay, well, look, let's have a little brief overview uh, before we get into my favourite part of the podcast, TT's television broadcast review from you, Tommy T, uh, about our experience. So sorry, Freya, this doesn't include you at this point, but your experience on the track on Friday. Experience on the track Friday. It was packed. Mm. I mean, we went 2019 and that was on Saturday. I think we were both there and then on Sunday and it was probably not as busy as it was on, on Friday this year. Um, I think Drive to Survive coupled with everyone in Australia and Melbourne, especially being locked down and not being able to do stuff. Uh, everyone, It's a perfect storm and everyone's unleashed and decided that F1 is the thing we're going to do and we're going to get back out and hundreds of thousands of people were at Albert Park and it was it was a great atmosphere, but it definitely makes it harder to immerse yourself into the racing is probably the best way to put it. James and I were kind of talking about it. I was like, I don't really feel like I know what's going on mm. as much as I normally do in a weekend, but it's kind of the trade-off you're going to have to take if you want to immerse yourself in the culture of F1 and kind of how exciting it is to be there. Trackside, hearing everything, the smells was something we kept commenting on. Like mm. you can smell like barge board getting like, ripped up from the ground and things like that that you, you miss over the years that we haven't had to we haven't been able to to experience but it was great wasn't it yeah honestly i look i agree i think that's a, the sentiment there is is very good the 
diversity of the crowd was significant for me. It is not what I would call a traditional Australian motorsport crowd, and that is a great thing. Of course, Drive to Survive has helped a lot in that space uh, in terms of bringing new people to the sport, including probably you if you're listening uh, and you've only been listening to us fairly recently as a result of Drive to Survive. It's not a bad thing. I know lots of people have gone on this train about Las Vegas and the Americanization of F1. Well, it's nice to be wrong because I'm here for it, to be honest. And the fact that Saturday was sold out, qualifying was sold out you know i i rocked up to the track uh around 10 o'clock and it was incredibly hard to get in there was already a crowd uh coming from flinders street station so it that is a a great great thing uh but certainly the vibe as a whole at the australian grand prix is very very uh good and in something that is interesting i think because it's been such a long time since we've had any kind of major uh, sporting event in the country uh, obviously, uh, with the Oz Open and a few other bits and pieces have sort of popped up along the way since the, uh, yeah. the pandemic and since the last time we tried to go racing here in 2020. But you could tell that Australians were ready for it, couldn't you? Uh, and and I think they absolutely deserves it. Uh, Dylan Alcott shouted at Martin Brundle that uh, <laughs> Ma- that Melbourne deserved it on the broadcast and uh, probably after a couple of beers, not going to lie, but he uh, he's not wrong. No. Uh, and it was it's certainly really good to, to see that. So, yeah. Absolutely fantastic. If you uh, haven't yet gone to a Grand Prix and you live in Australia, definitely worth checking out next year. Uh, I would suggest, though, you look at a grandstand because there was a time, well, at least the last time you and I went 2019, you could get a good vantage point walking around with GA tickets. But now, uh, just looking, we weren't at the track today um, and I'm kind of glad because the GA tickets... The, the, you wouldn't say much. You're not going to see a lot. No. Um, but uh, anyway, so shout out to you for if you've flown in from all around the country, all the world to to see this. Okay, let's get into my favorite part of the podcast. It is Tommy T's television broadcast review. <laughs> TT, you you mentioned it already, but that was it was great to see Brundle back on the grid walk with a packed grid walk. Uh, he grabbed a few random people, but one of the random people was Dylan Alcott, which was mm. great to see. Um, he grabbed some random guy who was uh, managing hot. director of Lion. <laughs> he was like, yeah. "I'm not allowed to talk to you bank. now." Actually, Damn it. <laughs> have you heard of Heineken 0.0? He's like, "Oh no, I don't and want this. I need to go somewhere else now." <laughs> exactly. Yeah, it was yeah. very, very sketchy for a second there, but that's what you get on Brundle just making things up. He was trying <laughs> to talk to a soccer player at one point. Who he first got his name wrong and then was trying to convince. <laughs> <laughs> and then he was giving him shit because Italy didn't qualify for the World Cup. Yeah. It's like not really a great way to build rapport, but that's Brundle. He's just being himself. Does what he wants. Like you, um, I think one of my have, highlights is probably. You two seconds with this person. Probably don't raise the fact, like don't raise their most recent failure. Like, <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> I mean, that's what we do around here. <laughs> <laughs> this is true. This is true. Yeah, is, that's the Lakeside Driveway. <laughs> that is. is true. That's our love language: <laughs> is raising everyone's Brilliant. most recent failures yes. and pinning yes. them to it. Um, no, I think it was really good seeing Oscar. Um, yes. Got to hear Oscar through the, the start of qualifying. I think it was maybe a practice as well. Uh, we saw him on the on the grid walk as well. He's just very professional for such a young guy to be as professional and slick as he was. Oh, so like, there was points when he was being asked a question throughout the broadcast and then he'd just be answering his question and something would happen on track and he'd just comment on it and then throw back. And it, it was like listening to someone like James who's like a polished professional <laughs> broadcaster extraordinaire. <laughs> and this is just young Oscar who's not trained in media in, in any way the capacity that James has been. Oh, so <laughs> for someone like Oscar to... <laughs> How dare you? How dare you? What is this? I walked into an ambush suddenly. Awesome. But That's no, what this is. Uh, like Oscar was excellent. <laughs> Set up, settle down to I am. I don't need to say anything. Um, I'm just going to sit back and listen. Yeah, ex- exactly. Um, I think there was a couple of little comments that we enjoyed. Everyone complaining about the sun coming down and not being able to see through their visors, I think universally. And then mm. within 10 minutes, the sun was down and they're like, I can't see anything now because it's, <laughs> I've got the darkest tint on. Yeah. Um, we had a comment about the most expensive lawnmowers from Crofty, mm. which kind of just went over. And then probably the best one was Brundle misquoting Daniel, <laughs> yes. saying something about sent the letter <laughs> instead of lick the stamp and send it, which is just exactly what we expect, right? 
Look, if there's nothing I love more than Sky just half remembering things that were yeah. said years ago and trying to bring it up. And look, you know what? If Brundle does it, I'm happy I'm to forgive him. I'm fine with him. Yeah. I'm happy to forgive him. <laughs> yeah. uh, Freya, anything from your end from a uh, television broadcast review? Um, I'm just trying to remember. I think that was three days ago in my time zone. I'm not sure. I'm back in the past <laughs> over here. Um, but <laughs> uh, I think my broadcasting point of view, actually, no, the moment which caught my attention was, oh, we're on the edge of the, the Tasman Sea. Um, well, yes, we're not. We mentioned this too. <laughs> I was like... <laughs> It's Bass Strait before you get to the Tasman Sea and it's Port, Port <laughs> Phillip Bay. God. Yeah, that one. Mm-hmm. Mm. Yes, but it doesn't sound exotic, does not it? Not the Tasman Sea. <laughs> <laughs> not the Tasman Sea. Uh, he loves no. it, doesn't he? So you brought this up with uh, the Corniche. Yeah, he likes Crofty. to say the Corniche. I think he likes to try and anglo things. and Finds really a body just... of water the British named and exactly. went, Exactly, that's mm. ours. And I'll bring it back to that. But James, what did you uh, what did you think of the the flyover and national anthem? We don't have Camby for the national anthem. No, so. we didn't even have a flyover, which is exceptionally disappointing. Um, and you're on notice, Oz Air Force. Have you got anyone you'd like to call out by name? Uh, plenty. <laughs> <laughs> I prepared this list a long time ago, and now I can finally bring out my Air Force friends. Uh, no, it was very disappointing yesterday. Though uh, at the track, there was a P fifty one D Mustang flying around the place, which was absolutely amazing. The roulettes. Cut some laps over Friday as well uh, as Thursday. That was good to see. So it's confusing to me that they didn't hook it up. Um, previous years, they've had the F-18 do it. The, the national anthem performance was okay. The MIDI track that they used is terrible. <laughs> like, guys, afford just a pre-recording of the track of the national anthem, not just a MIDI version. Like, you've spent so much money, $20 million <laughs> resurfacing the track. Yeah. You can't spend 14 bucks on a decent recording. You, of the you know what it National sounded Anthem. like? It sounded like when you buy one of those keyboards, it was a pre-recorded backing track and they just hit play and then you play over the top of it. <laughs> <laughs> It's lucky they didn't press the next button, which was like Maroon 5 <laughs> yeah. or something really exactly. poorly done from the early 2000s. <laughs> uh, yeah, so terrible. Like, And also, I mean, whatever, it was a pretty lackluster performance as far as I'm concerned. So it was very much a, a big no from me. Uh, a 1.3 out of 10 Oof. for both because the lack of flyover should almost be minus 10. Um, Tommy T, though, your overall score. I hate scoring. You know, I yeah, hate I know, scoring. That's why I get you to do it each it week. Because I change my metric every time, I, don't Yes, I? there is no metric as far <laughs> as I'm aware. <laughs> Sorry, have you got a metric? Like, I mean, it's on par with the FIA and everything. Like so let's be honest, it fits. You just deleted, <laughs> deleted a metric here or there occasionally. Fernando's been in your ear again. <laughs> We're going to need stewards. We're going to need stewards. Exactly. Oh, stewards oh, goodness, man. <laughs> Keep me in mind. I think maybe let's go a six. A six out of ten. You're, You're right. right. Absolutely makes no sense at all, nope. your metric. <laughs> so that's my favourite part. If you want to be a steward of Tommy T's television Please. broadcast review, hop, hop over to our Discord uh, and let us know in the race weekend yes. chat that you want to be a steward. And uh, we will even create a little channel, actually, <laughs> where after each episode, you can go on and you can pick up Tommy T's inconsistencies across the whole Please. year. Um, it's only fair after you criticise the stewards for changing so much last year at the FIA that you suffer your own penalty. This is as a dictatorship. A this isn't a democracy. What a wonderful I do what idea. I want. That's. Uh, <laughs> I didn't think Candy was here, mate. Sorry. I was, uh, oh, he is. Okay, good. Thanks, for, thanks for filling in. Uh, great. Well, that's that's that then. Done and dusted. And National Anthem flyover. Done and dusted. Let's talk about Formula One then, team. Uh, Freya, very sadly for, for VB, he ends his 103 Q3 entrances for qualifying. Isn't that incredible performance? From 2017 onwards, he has done that. Uh, an outstanding run that I wasn't even aware that he was on, to be honest. It was, do you remember being brought up, Tommy T? No. So, But for Freya, I mean, we love VB, don't we? And it was almost a shame that it was in Australia that he, he managed to lose that. But he got on the front foot and said, that's all right, I just have to start again. Well, that's it. And like you said, I had no idea that he was on that that run at all. 103 Q3, say that over and over again <laughs> too quickly. <laughs> get there quickly. No, but um, yeah, I didn't didn't realise he was he was on that. But it, it would have been um, great to have seen that that continue. And yeah, like you said, kind of sad that it was in Australia where he had his new helmet and um, obviously designed by mm. by Tiffany, looking great. And um, he's obviously mm. our adopted Australian, so that was a bit of a shame for his weekend generally, quite frankly, but um, we'll get to that. But, um, yeah, I didn't realise that he was on that milestone. Yeah, we, I mean, it just shows, again, the quality of driver that he is, that since 2017 continuing to do that. 
Outstanding. The other bit of news uh, was the safety car rule change ahead of this weekend. Tommy T, Max not allowed to do Max things, uh, had to remain behind the rear wing of the car in front. It was almost also reminded about that. <laughs> I mean, they've, they've borderline called it the Max rule. Yeah. It's like, well. He's the only yeah. one doing it. Uh, I mean, yep. in his defense, it wasn't specified before. So take every inch you can, my man. You would say that, uh, wouldn't you? Exactly. You can smell the Dutch from you from <laughs> yeah, here. Yeah, exactly. Uh, but I guess, okay. But is it, he wrong? it does make sense. Okay. Rear wing <laughs> makes more sense. Probably a bit safer. But yes. I, I'm totally with you. Like, if it, was, if it was there for the taking, he should have been doing it the whole time. So 100%. Uh, it's anti max regulation, but we'll survive it and he'll, he'll still be number one. It's fine. Interesting, interesting <laughs> take on that. Goodness me. Interesting, um, given that he oh, well, didn't finish, but anyway. Yes, interesting. Uh, let's talk, though, about the weekend now as a whole, the Oz Grand Prix. So good to have racing. But it almost feels like we're properly doing Formula One again now that we've started the season properly this weekend. We can ignore the first two races and only start from here. Uh, practice was great to watch. Tommy T, you and I and Campy uh, down standing there into the into turn three, uh, the end of a DRS zone. Uh, and it was so good to see just how they were really pushing the car close to that sort of 70 meters before pressing the brakes. It was later than we were expecting. Very late. Yeah. Uh, and these cars just look good, don't they? The McLaren especially... And I think the Ferrari, the Alpine looks worse in person. That is definitely <laughs> true. That is a disgusting <laughs> color. It just BWT, sort your crap out, get a new color scheme, and then become a sponsor. <laughs> but no, you're right. It was it was a great vantage point. We managed to find a little bit of shade. That was the biggest thing we were trying to find was a bit of shade because yeah. Camby looked like he was about to melt. He, sorry, to everyone who's listening, he still had his beanie on. He, <laughs> he arrives at 30 degrees and he arrives in in jeans that Freya thinks were sprayed on. They were. Um, uh, a green shirt uh, and a green beanie. In fact, at one point we lost him in the foliage. <laughs> you could only see his face in pants. Yes. <laughs> but no, we, we managed to find a good spot there. We, we liked it because you got to see cars at full throttle before throwing on the brakes before turn yeah. three. So that was... Great to see and, yeah, it was... It was just good to see practice and to see the changes to the track, of course. As I said, a $20 million change uh, to the resurfacing and new layout of the track. Um, and I'm interested in both your thoughts on this. Frey, let's start with you. Uh, the new design, we've lost uh, 9 and 10, which is moved around Lakeside Drive a bit now to that very fast chicane, which uh, Carlos and K-Mag both suffered through. But overall, would you say that... This is a better track that is producing better racing fryer than we've seen previously. Yes. I think it's hard to argue. I think it's my opinion is that it's hard to argue otherwise. Like we haven't seen that much overtaking, that much excitement um on the Melbourne track for for years. Like the improvements have made a huge difference um in terms of adding to the uh jeopardy going into that race. Um, which we <laughs> which we just don't have haven't had previously. I think it, there were some interesting comments in terms of have they overdone it, especially when there was originally the four DRS zones and could we just have got rid of the chicanes and the rest of it would have been fine. But I think as it turns out, it looks like they've kind of done a pretty good job. It turned out to be a not not super interesting race, and maybe the way that I'd hoped, but mm. still considerably better than it had been in previous years, which is at the end of the day what you want to see. Yeah, Tommy T, I wouldn't say that the racing was necessarily better. There was certainly some good overtaking opportunities with that double dipping of DRS. Yep. Oh, Deal. I don't think I just did a cross. Double there. helping uh, was the word. Yeah. yeah. It just the fact that <laughs> Yeah, you're right. It is double helping, not double dipping. But the fact that <laughs> that adds adds more jeopardy, good one, Freya, uh, to the whole scenario is good. But it was really the only point of the track that we could see anyone have a really good send unless you were so close to the car in front coming down the main straight out of last You turn. could have a half-assed look at 11, but most of the time it was like coming into to three. Yeah. It was your best bet. And it wasn't a, a move that you threw at the last minute. It was kind of like you were building to it from the final corner crossing the line in DRS through mm. those both both the first DRS points and then you were making the move before hitting three. And of course you you've driven the track. I have. In the polo. Oh yes. How she was it? Well. How was the surface? Did uh, did the car just the surface sort of glide was across? Happy yes. with it? What's uh, the, what's your score out of ten for the surface? Ooh. 
It's, it's probably a nine. It's probably a nine. Ex- it's excellent. We'll have to send that one to the stewards too, just to see what they think uh, of that score with absolutely <laughs> no background whatsoever. But it does look good. The surface looks good. And at least it's consistent around the whole track. Uh, it was good that we had um, some V8s and the S5000s racing around. Um, over the weekend in the Porsche Cup too, just to put more rubber down and all over the track, there wasn't a traditionally dirty, non-dirty side of the starting grid too which uh, was good. I also got rid of the grass belong alongside the straight where Danny Rick lost his front wing in 2019. Um, quite clearly in that Australia. That was the only change he had input on. Yeah, exactly. He's like, get rid of that <laughs> and yeah. that service road. Who put that there? <laughs> crazy. That's all he wanted. Crazy, crazy. Uh, okay, let's talk about um, – Oh, Dion, before we move on to qualifying, I want to talk about practice and Seb and Seb on a scooter. Um, this is, I, I think, Freya, the, probably the most iconic moment of the season so far. I mean, sure. The whole thing is absolutely comical. Like, especially with the the helmet kind of just perched on the head yes. and everything else. Like, honestly, who who are you? <laughs> it's like a crown. I I'm good, guy. Seb, here is my crown. I'm on a scooter. I'm not allowed to be on a scooter, but here I am. And I whatever. I'm here for it. <laughs> I think for me, just the fact that he was double waving to to people going around, yeah, like leaning on the scooter. The it has made for some of the best memes I've ever seen. Uh, and again, I mean, he's not going to be having a great start to the season, but I tell you what, in terms of content, mwah, chef's kiss to you, Seb Vettel. Uh, loves the crowd, which is which was good. But 5,000 euro fine. And as he said, it's a bit of a joke. Like, I mean, either make the fine worth it or, or not. Uh, and as he said, where does the money actually go? Uh, the FIA. Where does the money actually go? Where do you think the money yeah. goes? Let us know. Go to Discord and let us know. <laughs> Campy will uh, have his own thoughts. He's not here too, so we'll let yep. you know what he thinks next time. But that was definitely a favourite part, although he saw the scooter twice. We'll, we'll get to that eventually. Um, let's now, though, talk about qualifying, guys. Uh, Tommy T, it was, as you put, Canadian on Canadian crime, <laughs> 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 which I really enjoyed. Just what never happened? happened? Ever. Oh, what mate. bloody happened with Lance Stroll? I think, I mean, I can understand the confusion, but it seems like Latifi was told that someone was coming through on a fast lap, moved out the way. He's like, oh, it's Stroll and he's not on a hot lap. So I'm going to get on with my prep lap. So he went to move past again. Stroll decided to turn for no reason. That he, he hinted at the track kind of falling away there. It doesn't. You just moved. <laughs> Uh, and you, you collided with a fellow Canadian and you were more of a jerk about it, which is not the Canadian way. And Stroll, Canada is disappointed in you. You should be more humble and more Canadian when you approach these things in future uh, and people might like you. Yes, especially towards the uh, Prime Minister of Canada. Exactly. <clears throat> it's very, very disrespectful uh, by Lance Stroll. Uh, it, it just seemed weird, Freya, that... Latifi was told Stroll's on a fast lap, so he does the absolutely right thing, gets out of the way, Stroll backs out, corner, two corners beforehand. Latifi's like, well, okay, well, I'm on a prep lap with my tyres. I need to get it sorted out. If you're slowing down, I think after six into seven, like I'm going uh, and off he went and Stroll just kept cutting across. Uh, and as the steward's decision said, it was very clearly a lack of situational awareness by Lance Stroll to the car behind, which absolutely sums it up. But for you, making sure that Nick Latifi is not the crashing person, how did you? How does he recover from that when it wasn't even his fault? Oh, my gosh, but that's it. It doesn't matter anymore, though. Like, it doesn't matter that it's Stroll's fault, which it completely was, and I was actually really relieved to see that because you can never be sure much to the whole point <laughs> of the rest of this pod- podcast. Like, who knows what the stewards are going to say? We can sit here and go, that was very clearly Stroll's fault, and you can you see his head turn, you see him just gradually cutting in, but who knows what they're going to say. So I was pretty relieved that that was, in fact, the decision that was made. Um, but I think for Latifi, it's problematic because it doesn't matter that it was Stroll's fault. That is still the fourth now Grand Prix that you've crashed. And I think that's that's kind of, you know, the memory or that's the sticking point, unfortunately, like rightly or wrongly, it's kind of kind of how is it how it is. And you're sitting there going, oh yep, how long until the next one? And I think it doesn't matter that it, that it was on on Stroll. It's um I think next next Grand Prix Imola, you Latifi cannot crash at at Imola, mm. honestly. I think he's kind of his right on kind of tip of the iceberg in terms of just pushing it a little bit there and just being a bit of a laughing stock, if I'm being honest, as much as I love him, as much as I should be respectful to, you know, prime ministers of Commonwealth countries. um, Mm. I 
I think he's, yeah, going to have to be careful at him, to be honest, to stay out of trouble. And Williams can't afford this. I mean, you know, they're always taught, they were already rather towards the back of the pack last year uh, in terms of how the, the prizes were awarded cash wise. We're not exactly sure how much they get, but they wouldn't have got a lot for where they sat. Uh, and to have that many incidents, especially in Saudi, I mean, here two incidents in Saudi, you know, parts are not cheap, obviously, and, and it takes time for the mechanics. Um, the mechanics that I do want to talk specifically about, though, in this instance, Tommy T, are the Aston Martin mechanics oh. um, getting Seb's car ready after the incident he had in practice and Scootergate yep. uh, into the fact that there was a red flag because of the Latifi stroll incident managed yep. to get it. Like they were literally pulling the blue tape off of the factory parts yeah. seconds before that he was released out yep. to do a quali lap. Well, they were working on Stroll's car as well to make sure he got out for qualifying as well. So. Both cars were under significant amount of work going into qualifying um, after practice three anyway. Um, and then to have that happen in qualifying and then Seb today, just everything, everything has gone wrong for that team this week. Um, I don't know. It's just one of, we've seen it before. I've seen Red Bull mechanics a lot of the time, like managed to get things done. And it was very much of that kind of, uh, style, the mm. mechanics just getting together, hustling, making sure they managed to get out because we did have that delay because of Stroll that mean, meant Seb could get out and put a lap around, but it's just a lot of work for that already probably stressed team that's not doing so well. So, And it's all really for nothing in the end, which was disappointing. If, if Seb had have managed to get through to, to Q2, that would have been incredible and we were all hoping for that when we were watching. Um, just wasn't to be. The biggest surprise in a positive way, Freya, was McLaren performing pretty well uh, for, for qualifying DR in seventh, which was fantastic, and Norris showing some amazing pace and putting it in fourth. The fortunes have changed significantly from the first two desert races. As we said in our preview episode, the, the car's flaws potentially were more focused around the heat issue that exists there that wasn't necessarily the case here. But, of course, they would have brought some upgrades over the last two weeks too. Uh, it was good news though, wasn't it, to see McLaren back towards where they were last year hovering around the front of that mid-pack. Oh, absolutely. And there was a moment, I think, during free practice and there was a kind of looking over the live timings and DR was sitting in P3 and they're going, everyone stop the clocks. It's not <laughs> happening now. It's so just, <laughs> this is it. This is the result. DR for podium. I don't care if it's FP3, you know, this is, uh, this is it. This is the final result. Um, but what a relief in all honesty. Like it's, it's, you can talk about, yeah, whether it brought upgrades and having potentially solved some of the cooling issues and also just being the benefit of not being in the desert anymore as well. And just kind of the environment suiting their car better as well as potentially the track. Um, but at, at the end of the day, just what a relief. You know, it would have been absolutely heartbreaking to see DR um, at, at the back of the track or not making it through um, from the start of Quali um, at, at his home race. It would have been pretty hard pretty hard to watch, especially given the build-up this year in particular. Um, so more than anything, it was it was just a relief, quite frankly, as a, as a McLaren fan to watch. But it also gives you more hope for the rest of the races and for the rest of the season, you know, if there's more of that to come and if they keep stepping up. And that's kind of what we said last last week was they just need to get in the points and they both did. And um, I think, you know, given a few situations, they, they could have even finished higher, but who knows? So it does give you a little bit more of an optimistic outlook for the, for the rest of the season, for sure. It's definitely what we need. Absolutely. Uh, whilst it's, it's still very clear that I'm probably the most biased person in, in Formula One talking about Daniel Rick about how much <laughs> he is an amazing person. Uh, I was very, very worried there for a moment. So it's good to see the progression of the team. Love that. Uh, love that a lot. The other thing, of course, is they removed a DRS zone, Tommy T going into qualifying, thanks to Fernando Alonso's um, pointing out that it's a bit of a safety issue, um, seemed to really benefit Alonso. No and, way. You know, I couldn't believe it, really. The wily old fox <laughs> doing <laughs> something for safety. Shocking. Um, but for him to, for obviously, it was so unfortunate, this hydraulic failure that he had, TT, yeah. because up until that point, he was running faster than Leclerc, faster than the middle sector, yep. only a couple of tenths behind, or sorry, hundreds behind in the first sector. This is the kind of, and he said that you could see the disappointment on his face. This is the kind of Fernando Alonso that we've been waiting for. Obviously, he got his third in Qatar last year. Yep. He was able to, to defend against Hamilton to allow Ocon to have his first place in Hungary. Yep. 
this team, Alpine as a whole, uh, they're getting pretty lucky really with the the level of influence uh, that Fernando has in the grid yep. and to the FIA as well, but also his ability to, because when he does performances like that, and again, it was a, for- a shame and he hurt his hands, which is also not so good. Yep. But it's just like this poetry emotion, isn't it? It's like oh. when Martin Brundle is able to, without Crofty interrupting him, talk about Max Verstappen driving around somewhere like Spa where you're just like, this is absolutely amazing as a Formula 1 nut to listen to. Yep. Similarly with watching Fernando on that lap. It, it is. And this is exactly why Fernando came back. He didn't come back to be at the back of the grid to be just cashing a check. He wanted to be back in a competitive team and this is what he was promised from Renault at the time before they were Alpine that he was coming back into with new regulations and that was obviously delayed, but he's not here to muck around. He really wants to have a competitive car and challenge for wins and podiums. Uh, and you could see that he was hungry for that and he thought he had a chance this week. And I genuinely think he did. Yeah, I think that car looked great. I think it definitely had the potential. It was just unfortunate. The hydraulics let go at that exact moment into that corner, meaning that his qualifying was ruined. Uh, and then today, sa- the safety car timing just mm. didn't benefit him. Uh, to, to maximize that. And then he couldn't switch on the tire at the end. Just just little things didn't go his way, but he gave it a red hot crack, didn't he? He did. And we love to see it. We do. Uh, we love Fernando, the wily old fox. Uh, big fan of, of that, of course. Uh, the weird thing, and this is the second time this has happened in second year, um, Albon unfortunately disqualified from qualifying because the stewards couldn't get a one liter sample of fuel of his car. At the end of qualifying, of course, that happened to Seb Vettel. Uh, in the race in Hungary, talking about Ocon's win, why he was disqualified from that second position. But it's an interesting rule. <clears throat> but I mean, I understand that it exists, so that's fine. It was sort of unfortunate because, you know, fast forward to the race, his race pace was very good yeah. on 56 lap old tyres, still lapping exceptionally well. So um, Albon suffering a little bit of bad luck, but overall, Williams would be happy with his sort of results, I suppose, coming back into the team. He sort of seems, Freya, like that he's sort of set, he gets to one point and he goes, right, I'm happy with this point, take a smaller step forward. Uh, and whilst it's maybe not the big leaps that we've seen with, you know, Russell getting into Q1 or sorry, out of Q1 and Q2 and Q3 in the past, he's probably going to fly more under the radar and then start delivering results like we've seen today. Potentially, yeah. And he kind of held his own today, he kind of sat in about seventh or so for a, for a long time and yeah didn't didn't really move here and there I was kind of just wondering waiting for waiting for something to happen and just kind of again with the coverage it's a bit hard to tell what's going on and I was there getting very confused I was like is, has he pitted how why is he there is he not there like what it's very hard to tell um but he held his own there and there were moments where he was getting challenged quite significantly and I think did a great job defending um at moments um so yeah, I think it's it's interesting though because obviously, like you said, he does tend to fly under the radar a little bit. Um, just he's a bit more humble than perhaps some of the other drivers that you see floating around, um, which at the end of the day potentially helps him when it comes to those those types of things, right? He just quietly does his, does his thing. Um, it was seemed like a bit of an odd weekend for him though, like you said, bad luck in, in qualifying. And then for a moment there, I don't know, actually don't know what the penalty is for not pitting. Um, like, let's see what the stewards decide to do with that it one. Um, well, yeah, but, but also didn't um, seem that the Sky commentators knew either. No, to be fair. no. Um, but I was like, are you going to get disqualified from from quali and from the race? Like, I wasn't sure what was going to happen there. <laughs> but, uh, no, I think I think they'll be happy with with how with how he's going. And today he he held his own. The other big surprise before we talk about the race was the lack of pace shown in Haas, Tommy T. Yeah. Uh, certainly we were expecting bigger things, or I certainly was expecting bigger things out of that outfit, uh, certainly with the result that K-Mag has had in the past here with Haas and also with McLaren at Albert Park, but uh, qualified in 16th, uh, being out-qualified by his teammate for the first time, Mick Schumacher in 15th. So uh, the team really back to where they were last year, it almost seems. If yeah. They maybe haven't been able to bring the upgrades that they've needed like everyone else has in these last two weeks. Yeah, or it's one of those things where they just happen to be really good in the desert and not here, kind of inversely to McLaren maybe. Mm. Um, their cars are set up opposite maybe. Something like that. But no, it was not what we expected. Um I was expecting them to be kind of sitting around like 8th, ninth, 10th kind mm. of range for qualifying because we, we've expected that car to qualify well and maybe fall off in the races, but this was almost an inverse, which we do see cars do quite often. We do. Year to year. It's like, let's overcorrect and we go the other way. <laughs> uh, 
Um, yeah. But I think Gunter was on the pit wall this week. We didn't see him during the race from memory, but mm. during practice and qualifying, he was just kind of saying, we haven't had a good run at it. Kevin had some bad luck with all of his runs. He just kind of had some traffic or red flags or safety cars. So just, we never got a good bite of it this week to kind of really show what the car could do. But I don't think it was much more, to be honest, than what they did show. Yeah. Yeah. It was it was sad, though, in a lot of ways because Freya, I think, as we've said, the the joy of K Mag being back in the paddock, we're sort of you know willing him along in lieu of DR not performing so well. But now I suppose again it's inversed <laughs> to use your term TT uh, with DR now back where he belongs or closer towards the front, and and Kevin unfortunately and Haas down the back. Hopefully they can sort it out though ahead of Imola. Uh, I mean it is a Ferrari power unit. Uh, so it is one of the strongest in the field. I'm sure there's some things that they can bring some upgrades hopefully in the, in a couple of weeks. But I still have that joy about K Mag. He just he's made me so happy this weekend with his social media. Yeah, I mean that joy definitely led to me putting him in my fantasy team. So that's yes, go well. same. Um, <laughs> yeah, and me. <laughs> Um, but yeah, no, it, it wasn't the weekend for them. And like you said, you kind of have they have they overcorrected a bit um, in terms of trying to maybe even leverage the strengths that they had on the last couple of weeks, and then that not working out so well for them. So hopefully they can figure out what that what that is before we, we move over to um, to Imola. But that was almost one of the biggest. That was almost the most drastic shift I think we kind of saw on the grid week to week. You know, especially between between both drivers as well. Um, just, yeah, not where we expected them to be, which is pretty disappointing. Um, but luckily that joy was then filled with a bit more success from McLaren. So still some some sort of buoyancy there. <laughs> <laughs> Got to take it where we can. All right, let's yeah. talk now about the race, team by team analysis, as we always do. This is one of the points uh, that I know that you guys love about this podcast and it makes me incredibly happy because I know a lot of other podcasts ignore a lot of other teams. So thank you for leaving that feedback uh, in the Q&A that I did uh, a little bit uh, a while ago rather on on Instagram. It's it's awesome. Uh, We will start towards then the back of the pack and we're just speaking about them. Haas, Schumacher 13th, Magnussen 14th. Uh, Overall, again, not a a solid weekend for them team-wise towards the very back of the grid. Again, as we've just mentioned, hopefully some upgrades can be brought along uh, Freya, Mick Schumacher, though, outperforming uh, K-Mag, and he had some moves around the outside, which uh, a bit of wheel-to-wheel racing, especially early on as well. I think he was alongside Sainz when Sainz was still racing, uh, and that's good to see. I mean, Mick obviously has a lot to prove. He had a really a terrible shunt, didn't he, in Saudi Arabia, which uh, really struggled. For, well, he didn't race at all, no entry in the car, so if, this is only the second race for him, uh, and he'd be happy with the result of out-qualifying K-Mag. I think so. Um, in that, you know, everyone was very celebratory of, of K Mag over the last couple of weeks, and and rightly so. So I think even if neither of them are where they feel like collectively they should have been um, overall on the grid, for him to have outperformed his teammate, then is kind of the best you can ask for. Really, if if that's where you are as a team in comparison to everywhere else, um, I was just glad to see him back and racing confidently. Um, I think after a shunt like that, you just never quite know how it's going to um, affect a driver. But he had a bit of a lead up. Um, in Australia, went to Australia Zoo and all sorts of things. So I think maybe feeling pretty settled. And he kind of um, was he was brushing off a lot of comments about about his accident actually, and and not really talking too much about it. Oh yeah, you know, it was a crash. Mo- moving on. I think he just wants to focus on the next race. Um, which, to be honest, I actually think he did did fairly well. Like you said, out qualified out qualified his teammate, and that's probably the best he could do this weekend, given where the car seems to be at for this track. Yeah, I think that's fair enough. TT thoughts on Mick. I mean, he he did absolutely hung out with the Irwin crew up uh, up in Queensland, which was very was actually very cool. He also went surfing too at uh, at the Urban Surf. Yeah, he's just trying to get amongst it, which is fantastic. But yeah, yeah trying to reshape the narrative a little bit away from the crash and and more yeah. focusing on what's going on on track. Well, I think all we've known of him is is his dad. Really, he's in the shadow, and now he's just like, no, nah, I'm a, I'm a human being. This is what I do. I want to go surfing, I want to enjoy life, I want to do all these other things. So he's just trying to create some personality and be a bit more of himself and not be defined by only that one thing that we all know him for, which is his his surname. Mm. Um, but he's been solid. He's been kind of out of the limelight on race weekends maybe more so because of K-Mag and I think he's kind of maybe enjoyed that for once. Usually he was in there because something had crashed, because his teammate had crashed. Like All those other things, the bad publicity that Haas was getting for a while, but now it's He's just kind of like skated through these first through 
these first three uh, race weekends and I think he's doing a really good job and it's evident now because he's really competitive with someone as good as K-Mag, uh, which we all respect K-Mag and think he's a great driver. So that's a really good start because last year we were comparing him to a Who? dud. <laughs> Never heard of Basically, someone who's no longer in the sport. So yeah. we didn't have a really good measuring stick, um, but now we do. And I think this is going to be a really exciting season to see if he actually does have the potential to continue on in future years or if this is kind of the year where he's shown to be not not good enough and maybe just will phase out of Formula 1 eventually. We hope not, though. We do hope not. That's absolutely right. Let's talk about Aston Martin, then Seb Vettel, Freya, just so unfortunate. He a First race of the year, of course, for him. He suffered the incident, of course, in uh, practice, which put him behind. He tried to get out uh, and put a lap in. It's really the first proper lap that he's done in qualifying, qualified 15th, uh, and then was just, sorry, 17th, I should say, then just unable to really get to grips with it, uh, came across the swimming pool section uh, and just lost control over that that curb, which did look slippery when we were looking down that that part of the track uh, on Friday of just the, the S five thousands and V eight supercars losing a little bit of grip in, in there, and, and um, certainly for, for FP two as well, uh, for FP one rather. So it was interesting that he did that. It's a shame. I don't want him to continue to spin again. We we want good guy Seb to remain good guy Seb, but Freya was. I mean. <sighs> We wanted to expect more for him, but Aston Martin's just really not the the team that anyone thought they were going to be this year. There are literally no parts left in that garage. <laughs> like, <laughs> I don't know where they're going to get their they car from. They can't be. But that's the thing. I actually think for, for them, you do kind of need to talk about them as a team first before you talk about the drivers and, like, what is going on there. Um, it started off for Seb um, a bit unfortunate, you know, over the, over the weekend, um, but then, yeah, like when he lost it, um, the race kind of out of, out of turn four, I think it was, it was just, oh, just disappointment. And like you said, it's, it's not what you want to see from someone like Vettel. We know that he's still got it as a driver. We know that he's an incredible racer, um, but he doesn't have the car to do it in right now. Um, and it's, but it's interesting to see what's going on with him in comparison to Stroll. I think moving then on to him, you go you, there, you're seeing something different going on. You're seeing potentially some poor judgment, poor decision-making, and that's when you can start to compare what's going on within the car and what then what's going on between the two drivers and what's different there. So, you know, Vettel, quite a bit of bad luck and um, the incident, but then Stroll, more of a judgment issue. But either way, that car is not where it needs to be and they probably won't have one next weekend. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, Aston Martin will be really searching through the scrap bin, um, maybe of just the Force India parts, if there's anything yeah. left in the garage there. But it's interesting, yeah. isn't it? Because Aston, it's it's we spoke about this last year, and the campus is happening, and this whole development, this investment into the team. Force India traditionally performed exceptionally well with a very small budget and a very small group of people. They've now lost a lot of those people, or they've been replaced. So Checo's gone, Otmar's gone. A few other key people have also moved around. And the intent, I understand, you know, from Stroll Senior is to send it up to be a championship winning car. I get it. But it just seems, Tommy T, that it is completely just not working. And, and the magic of what they did through Force India and Racing Point and how they worked uh, is just gone. And it, I wouldn't say that there's a good vibe there right now. No, and I, that's exactly the point I was going to touch on. I think it's a cultural thing. It doesn't seem like a culture of trying to win for and work for each other. It feels like everyone's kind of pointing fingers, blaming like your job is to do this, your job is to do this. And everyone's just kind of blaming each other and there's no unity in like working towards a unified goal, which is to win races. It seems like everyone's kind of split and trying to build the business and grow the brand. And it seems like there's too many other motives going on rather than just being really fast and consistent on a racetrack, um, which is what Force India did only they were useless at marketing they were useless at like everything else other than making that car go fast and that's why they were good because and that's kind of why people like them as the underdog whereas like Aston Martin doesn't feel like an underdog because it's got so much money behind it we know this we know it's a big global brand all these kind of things so it's really hard to kind of get behind them as a as like a cultural thing because they seem like a a spoiled brat of a team unfortunately and that's kind of Stroll is the avatar for that team and unfortunately his actions reflect upon the whole team and that's kind of the culture that they've assumed. 
I saw so much more Haas merchandise than I saw Aston Martin merchandise yep. around the track, and that is very interesting to me. I don't think I've ever seen mm. Haas merch, so I think that that speaks volumes. And it is a shame in a lot of ways. I hope for Seb's sake, not for Stroll's sake, I couldn't care less, but I hope for Seb's sake they figure it out yep. and they get it sorted out. I mean, at this point, Campy would say Stroll is good in one in every 46 races. Yeah, it's been a while. His, his, uh, quali- Look, he did well in that qualifying session um, with the pink Mercedes to put it where he did and put it on pole. That was fantastic. But now it just it seems to be slipping away. Uh, and anyway, uh, we don't need to talk about Stroll anymore. Let's talk about Williams, though. First points of the season, Alex Albon, Freya, getting that 10th position, running basically to the very end of the race on, well, he did, on a hard set of tires. Incredible, incredible stuff. And he was lapping very comparable times to the other cars around him um, towards, I think it was four or five laps to go. It kind of looked like he would be pushed out of the points. In fact, I think when he pit, the commentator said, oh, it's unfortunate he'd be pushed out of the points, but Williams did such a good job. But the strategy here, uh, he managed to get 10th, which is fantastic for Alex Albon to come back into the sport, get his first point, get Williams to get points in the in the third race is great. Um, and even better, Freya, Nick Latifi didn't crash into a wall, um, which uh, was for your friend, maybe not such a good thing for her glass. <laughs> yeah, she was. She didn't get a drink all night, much like Kimmy. No drinks for you. <laughs> um, but uh, <laughs> so, yeah, essentially there was like, no, 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 I'm fine. I don't need a drink. I'll wait till Latifi crashes. We know, we all know it's not going to take long. And then he didn't and it was amazing. And so <laughs> she didn't get anyone. But, uh, <laughs> but no, it's, um, it was, it was good to see, um, it was good to see Albon um, just hold on to the points, just much, much like commentators. I thought the same and it felt a bit unfair. I was like, if you, I'm not quite sure what the strategy is here. Um, mm. Obviously from, from our vantage point, you're going to run him right to the last second and then leave him with, not enough time to be able to work to get any um, any places back potentially, but just held on to points, which at the end of the day is you know it's a pretty good result for them um, and and for him as well coming coming back into the sport. Um, I think he completely he completely held his own in that kind of seventh to tenth, tenth where he was sitting prior to to those last couple of laps. And um, yeah, just in terms of general pace, was absolutely on it. So that was that was great to see. Um, and I think from in terms of Latifi, yeah, not a great weekend. To fair, crash wasn't his fault, but don't do it again. <laughs> <laughs> you heard it here first, Nikki. Don't do it Williams again. Williams yeah. is a beautiful looking car in person, Tommy. Yep. Campy's favourite livery, uh, as as he said. And it was looking good. Look, again, I'm happy for Albon. I think he he performed pretty well. Well, he performed exceptionally well. That That has to be said for a team that, were not towards the front where they thought they were going to be as a result of last year. You know, Al- Albon even said to a very good friend of the show, Michael Laminato, in when he was talking to him on stage, you know, Alfa Romeo and Haas have made significant improvements. We thought we were going to be there with them. Very evident that we haven't done that. So now it's about just taking the small wins and gains. As I said earlier, it's taking those baby steps towards success. And that actually shows here. And as a result of Drive to Survive, we all love Yost Capito now. Uh, and so Yost deserves a bit of success here too. He does. I think I'm going to continue to put the blame on the Mercedes power unit, I think. Until we know otherwise, it's it's those teams that have been affected and seem significantly behind the pace kind of across the board, um, trickling down from Merck through McLaren down to all the way to Williams. So I feel like if that can get back to where it should be in, in a competitive way, I feel like all the other gains that they have made will come to fruition and they will be back above the Haas and the Alphas and those kind of things. But yeah, I think um, they're doing a great job considering I, we do like the lineup. Those drivers are great. Mm. Both of them are lovely and I really enjoy listening to them. I, Alex Albon was do, going through one of his laps on the, the sky pad and he was really engaging and just honest. I, th- I feel like that's what you get from both of those drivers is they're just raw and honest. You're not feeling like this is a rehearsed kind of media strategy. It's just them being themselves and just trying to engage with the fans, which is what we want. We want to see that kind of stuff. So. I hope things go well for them. Um, and that's kind of all we can do. Um, it, there doesn't seem to be anything else other than like if Mercedes sort their power units out and they make a gain here and there, but just keep being in it. And that's kind of the best Williams we saw last year was the opportunistic Williams where they would stay out late and they would go for these alternate strategies and, and kind of risk it 
for the, the off chance that it comes off. It's, I'd rather that because if you're out of the points, you're out of the points. You might as well risk it to, to gain a few points than just like, oh, that's pretty risky. We might only come 17th instead of 15th. Who cares? You're not getting a point anyway. Just risk it to get those points. And I think that was what Yoss came in last year and did. And I, I really liked that as a culture shift for that team. Yeah, and we wish them all the best, as you say, in terms of that. We uh, we would love to see Williams back towards the front uh, and certainly Albon to to get back towards the front after his departure from Red Bull in the fashion that happened there. Alpha Tauri, Pierre Gasly, ninth, Sonoda, 15th. Now, Tommy T we, and Freya, all three of us, very aware of just how much of a legend Pierre Gasly is. Now, this is not – I'm not trying to flex here, but I, on – uh, on Thursday night, I had uh, dinner with uh, AlphaTauri's Alpha social media manager, which hopefully we will be interviewing on the podcast uh, in a couple of weeks' time. Josh Cruz, legend of a guy, also Australian, uh, and he was he was we were talking about uh, the content that he gets and the interaction that he has with the drivers. And he said, for both Yuki and Pierre, they are both so accommodating, willing to do all of the the clothing transfer things and all of the stuff and there's just no pretense or ego there. He was saying they're very just happy and willing to get out there and do some good stuff, which makes sense because he seems like that to us, doesn't he? You know, from a point of fan point of view, what you see is what you get. He's exceptionally lovely. Um, again, it was, it was a shame what happened with him in, in Red Bull. A lot of people were very quick to put him in the bin, <coughs> Campy, uh, and that's okay to be wrong. Um, it's, yeah. it's nice for us to be right. Yes, he's very wrong. And he has no right to reply because he's not here. Yeah, no so, commitment. <laughs> and that's kind of how the rules work on Lakeside Drive. If you're not here, you're just assumed wrong and you get no right to reply ever. Yes, like, um, like yeah. both of you actually have suffered. <laughs> we had a couple of questions uh, asking why Campy wasn't wearing his uh, trench coat to yeah, we did. To the track. Mm. Uh, he said that it was a bit too hot for a trench coat. Yeah. Um, and but not for a beanie. To go with the, but not for a beanie. The all green number. The, well, the trench coat and the beanie would, would have clashed. So he, he would have, have melted. Had, yeah. It would have been a bye bye campy into yes. a, just a, a but, pile of beans. But I too was very I disappointed drive. not to see him kitted out head to toe in Alpha Tauri. Um, but he said if Alpha Tauri want to send him a beanie or some kind of more lightweight Australian attire, he would be more than happy to <laughs> don that for the next uh, Grand Prix. And cycle it in with his Minardi jacket. Yes, exactly. From, yes. Uh, of course, Mark Webber's <laughs> debut where he got P5. Very impressive that he still got it. Uh, indeed. But <laughs> for, for you, Freya, Alpha Tower as a whole, uh, Sonoda didn't seem like he was totally comfortable in the car, as I said, P15. Um, and Gasly was lucky to hold on P9. He, he, look, he locked up towards the end of the race there and, and was running a bit wide. So struggling obviously with the, the graining on the front tires still. It's maybe not the strength of the car that they had last year. Certainly uh, McLaren, of course, now faster than them compared to the first couple of races. But do we still think that this is sister team? At least both cars finished, I suppose, unlike Red Bull. I mean, yeah, that's true. They were kind of in no man's land though, weren't they? Um, this weekend, I feel like with with Gasly and, um, and Sonoda, like the qualifying was... Yeah, kind of neither here nor there and then kind of the same for the race really. Um, I think they were a bit unlucky with their timing um, in terms of when they pitted with safety cars coming in and stuff as well. So they had a, a little bit of bad luck against them there but not something that you would have thought they wasn't possible to to make back. Um, but, yeah, no, I think like we'd, we'd hopefully see more from them the rest of the season, not their weekend Sonoda doesn't look comfortable, I don't think. Um, so I'm not quite sure what adjustments they'd make for him um, going into the next race. But, um, yeah, I think I just want to see more more racing from them, really. They, they seem to get lost in the pack a little bit. And you just want to see them in, with, in the action a lot more, um, hopefully, in the next couple of races. Let's talk about the other Alpha, Alpha Romeo. Uh, almost double points finish. Uh, Joe finishing 11th for the second race in a row. Valtteri Bottas in 8th. Best helmet design of the weekend. Absolutely no doubt about that. As Freya said, Tiffany's designed it. Looks fantastic. Yep. Got Sharky on there. Sharky? There's the Brighton <laughs> beach boxes down the, on the perfect. back. There's, yep. Oh, it was the whole thing was just, it was Bonza. The whole but it's thing. It's also just, his, uh, his explaining it as well. Like the, the yes. design is one thing, Good but day. him explaining it is just amazing. Um, I just loved it. We've got Sharky here yep. and oh, BB, love you. Yeah, he's such he's such a lovable guy. He missed a trick. He could have just done Victoria Bitter and just got it over with. Oh, and maybe just done a, a red and green. Do you know what he has branded. done? <laughs> he's done a gin. We're actually now in direct competition yeah. with him, Tommy T, yeah. you and I. He just well, he's got good taste. Coffee, 
Like he's now, just Formula One. You he finished he's Formula One because <laughs> you're a peak athlete as well. I am. Mm. Yeah. Not sure what in, <laughs> but something. Yeah, something. <laughs> uh, but yes, for Joe eleventh again, uh, a br- not a bad performance. He had some fantastic battles. Yep. Uh, he looked like he was impeding a lot of people on free practice on Friday when we were there, but that's okay. Apart from that, he's, he's learning, he's getting over it. Uh, and again, Valtteri in eighth. It's good. Points finish. And the fact that, okay, he's not in that second seat Mercedes anymore, but they're not exactly, you know, blistering pace with, okay, third and fourth handed because Verstappen got out. So if Verstappen had ended up finishing fifth, you know, and then ninth, the, the disparity is not significant between oh, no, George is second in the driver's. How did that happen? We'll get to it. But for, for Valtteri, though, he does just look a happy boy. Yep. And for everyone who loves him and appreciates him as a driver as much as we we do on this podcast, and it's not because we've uh, adopted him as an Australian because of Tiffany, because he just seems to be a lovely guy. Yeah. Uh, we are very, very happy for him in that space, aren't we? Yep. Yep. And it's good, good to see. Let's talk about Alpine. It's, we sort of already mentioned this with Fernando Alonso. Yeah. A massive shame, seventeenth for him. Um, Ocon finishing in the points in seventh, though. What could have been Tommy T? Fernando was really on a flying lap, as we mentioned. Yep. He's got the wiliness of being able to defend against cars like Hamilton's. We saw who were absolutely much, much, much faster than that Alpine last year. Yep. Uh, and on a track like this, where positioning the car to stop overtaking is incredibly important. We know he can do that. Yes. Uh, but for Ocon, a bit of no man's land again, it seemed. Yep. He kind of just found himself in that spot between kind of DRS trains. He was at the back of one for a little bit and then kind of fell off. And then he was at the front of one that was behind him. So he kind of just managed to not bother anyone, stay out of trouble and just run a clean race and walks away with points. I mean, end of the day, if you're going to walk away with points – in seventh, that's better than, I don't know, risking it to be out of the points. Like I said before, if you're out of the points, risk it all. Like, But once you're in that point, it's kind of hard to kind of do anything drastic to maybe net an extra two, three points here and there. It doesn't really make sense, especially when you've had your teammate who was on that riskier strategy kind of have that fall through. So the team would probably just like hold station, look after the tires, let's get to the end of this, let's net some points and then we'll, we'll regroup next time. And he does that well. Like we can never really knock him for keeping the car out of trouble most of the time <laughs> um, in his more recent career. Anyway, he's definitely been more responsible and just reliable. Freya, how did you see Alpine? Of course, it was a shame we didn't get to see any Oscar Piastri in car action. Tommy T already touched on it with the broadcast though. When he was on mic with whoever it was, he was a consummate professional dare I say, uh, and was able to give a brilliant insight and an amazing commentary as as we deserve as fans really on, on the broadcast. But apart from him not being able to jump in the car, how did you see Alpine this weekend? Yeah, and just on the Piastri front, like he's so articulate, you know, for somebody who hasn't had that media exposure until this point really and then has kind of been thrown into it. Um, you know, Alpine, you'd suggest, is probably doing a pretty good job of training him in that in feeling comfortable in that area I think though also he's he's such a calm guy as we which we've talked about quite a bit that he probably you know doesn't get too um you know frazzled by the the media frenzy um in the lead up to a race anyway but yeah I know he just came across as as articulate and um and yeah provided really good insights for people who are listening in I think um in terms of um Ocon, yeah, like you said, he stayed out of trouble and he would have been trouble, I think, if he had tried much. If you think about it, most of the time he had Ricardo immediately ahead of him, Norris ahead of him. I'm like, yeah. that's not a tangle you want to get in, I don't think. So nah, not walk in away, Australia, walk certainly away, not. Nope. <laughs> no, walk away with your points um, in seventh and, and be happy with that. Um, Alonso, oh, had such high hopes, such high hopes, watching him power through that second sector in um, in quali. And um, it kind of reminded me of when, you know, Max binned it um, when he was on that absolutely flying lap, um, yep. just blistering and then, you know, just done away. So that was that was pretty heartbreaking, as, especially when you saw the disappointment from Alonso as well. He's kind of going, yeah, this is the best weekend I've had in years. And um, yeah. to then not be able to materialise that in um for, for him in terms of, you know, points or, or, or poles or podiums, um, disappointing. But... Overall, I think the the car's pretty hopeful for the season. Like they do have pace, um, and they work well together as a team, which we've seen on multiple occasions. Um, and then even with with Piastri in there as well. So I think like it's it's really enjoyable to watch them operate. 
Yep. And uh, look, if if there's any opportunity for Oscar to get in that car this year, Jesus is going to be good just to see that level of raw talent that he very clearly has yep. uh, perform and hopefully shine uh, at some point, even if it's in a free practice session. But so if you're Alpine, why wouldn't you have thought about that this this week? I think yeah. as, as just to, to get a supporter base behind your brand mm. for the future, you have this young driver that's incredible. Throw him a free practice. That would just get everyone who's undecided in Australia like, I'll buy Alpine merch. I'm in. Whatever. Like, mm. oh, let's go. I'm here for this. But they just kind of missed out. And they're like, next year's going to be too late because he's going to be driving for someone, whether it's them or not. They really missed out on capitalizing on the Australian market, which is growing not as fast as, as America maybe because of just sheer population. But I feel, I really feel like that was an opportunity missed. Yes, like you probably want to get practice to the actual drivers, but I think if you're zooming out, like that really could have spared it just for how much it would have benefited Australian fan bases and just growing their brand. 100%. Everywhere. Like, do yep. you sell many Renaults down here? Don't think you do. Would have loved <laughs> to have seen it. And uh, as you say, I mean, Oscar deserves that level oh. of praise. It's interesting though, isn't it? When you think about the, the last time that we had a race here, he was not Formula 2 world champion. He was not Formula 3 world champion. Uh, he was in his season of About uh, to be. Italian F4, I think, from memory. So yeah. the the fact that he, oh. since the last time we've raced, has had consecutive world championships. Yep. Incredible. Incredible. And the fact that he gets to do it in his proper home race is really good to see. I'm so happy that we get to talk about McLaren at this point of the podcast. Uh, <laughs> DR in six, Landon Norris in fifth. Uh, Freya, DR arrived at the track a little early today. He spent about 40 minutes uh, going through and signing every single fan's autograph he could possibly get his hands on, having selfies, doing all those things. Uh, often we talk about you know, how drivers need to be focused. We've spoken to Michael Italiano on this podcast as well about how he, specifically on Australian weekend as well, focuses Michael, but uh, focuses Daniel rather. But I think Michael would have allowed Daniel that little bit of time to go in and be invested from these fans because there is this energy, this oh. massive buzz. When I was at qualifying yesterday, every time uh, DR drove around the track, people were applauding. You know, yes. that hasn't happened. Even when in Renault days, he wasn't doing no. that. So there's this energy, Freya, that... Is, bringing, is being brought rather along to, to Daniel from the crowd and to the crowd from Daniel. We love to see it. And whilst it was unfortunate he didn't pip Lando, the fact that he was holding on to Lando the entire way, like there was nothing really in it at the very end of the race, yep. is a massive improvement from not only what we've seen in the first couple of races, but this time last year where the disparity was huge. Yes, it was, yeah, like I said, more of a relief than anything for me to to see that as a result in the end. And I kind of wondered, without being able to hear all your know, team radios and whatnot, kind of how much of that is being told to kind of hold position as much as anything else. Um, and right at the start there, I think they, they kind of, it almost looked like they were getting held up by um, George Russell a little bit um, to let yeah. Hamilton kind of get ahead. Um, so even then you kind of just watching him just sit back. So I'm not even sure that the end result of Norris being one place ahead of him was really, um, indicative of the true pace that potentially could have seen at different points of the races from DR. Um, but nevertheless, in terms of an outcome, it's just so much, um, more impressive than, than the last couple of weekends. I think from DR specifically this weekend, um, it looks like they've got a much better balance in terms of a home race. We know that's been traditionally kind of a bit of a challenge for him in the past, just in terms of balancing all the media commitments and the pressure that yeah. comes with um, all of those fan engagements and everything else. But then obviously, you know, you can only give so much and at the end of the day what really matters is being able to give it, give it on the track and um, it seems like he's in a much better place with balancing all of those obligations and responsibilities as well as that time to to focus prior to prior to qualifying and races. So it was generally just really um, enjoyable to watch. Unfortunately, I, I can't uh, empathise with the vibe, so to speak, that you're feeling because I wasn't there. But um, You'll get payback soon. <laughs> which mate. I was reminded of all weekend in like every single social media <laughs> message, WhatsApp, bloody everything coming at me from every single angle um, about how good it was to be in Melbourne over the weekend. Um, but I can certainly imagine that it would have been pretty good. It was a very, very good vibe. And the sea of papaya hats and merch <laughs> 
Uh, although, I'm sorry, guys, I'm not spending $90 on a purple DR hat. It's just it's a little too much. Uh, anyway, it was it was really, really great to see. Mercedes, let's talk about them. George Russell, first podium, first proper podium, can I just say? It's like the yes. second podium in F1. Yeah, but his first one really wasn't. So hats off to him, I suppose, for this, for it being his first proper one and actually deserving it in this instance out of a race. Uh, of course, his qualifying and Spa was amazing. That's fine, but still, whatever. Yeah. That was a bit of a joke of a race. Now, though, being able to be ahead of his teammate, thanks yep. to a safety car, let's be honest. I mean, yeah. Hamilton was outperforming up until that point, but yep. like we've seen in previous races, it is the luck of the draw. But certainly, TT, McLaren's main competitor almost looked like it was directly the uh, supplier in, M- in Mercedes this weekend. Yep. And I wonder if it's going to remain that way throughout the year. I think you're probably going to see better kind of from the engine side of things for Mercedes. And I think you're going to see a lot more development in the aero and the, the actual car build from McLaren. I think that's where their competitive edges are going to be. But it is going to be interesting. Um, George has been great so far. He's been good in qualifying, been really on the pace, probably more so than I thought uh, straight away, like really close and comparable to Lewis, which is good. And that's exactly what he would be hoping for as well. He's He's not there to be the good studious little boy and just fall in line behind Lewis. He's there to be competitive. And he's he said that in not such words as that, maybe, but he's he's made it pretty clear that he wants to wants to take the fight. Um but yeah, like just luck of the draw today that he managed to beat Lewis. Lewis was definitely faster uh through that first period, but just the way the pit stops shook out. Um yeah, George managed to get get on the podium. Yeah. And he's second in the World's Drivers' Championship. He's, yeah, I'm pretty sure he's second in the World Drivers' Championship from just being consistent. That's what I thought I heard mentioned before. Maybe I might be corrected, but he's had a few good points finishes. Um, he is, 37 yeah. points. Charlotte Leclerc, 71 points. George Russell, 37. Carlos Sainz, 33. And this is what happens when you're consistent, right? Right. So you don't have to be necessarily the fastest two cars on the grid, evidently. Nope. Uh, just get it amongst there. Who would have thought that this is where we would be falling out of uh, last year? But for you, Freya, Mercedes overall, I mean, Hamilton seemed pretty happy this weekend. He did a bit of skydiving uh, in Dubai with uh, Angela, his his physio and trainer. There is an excellent uh, meme. If you go to Lewis's own, he shared it himself, go to Lewis's own Instagram and look at his story. There's a great meme of them both skydiving out of the plane together and someone's photoshopped all of Lewis's bags and hats and drink bottles and scooter and everything else <laughs> into Angela's hands as she's free falling out of the plane next to him. Um, but but not a bad result for Mercedes third and fourth considering the disparity again between race pace uh, between Red Bull, Ferrari and, and now Mercedes. Hopefully McLaren can can be that that team that's challenging for third. We didn't think that would be the case that they'd be challenging Mercedes necessarily, but for for the way that they've performed, flying a little bit under the radar seems to be the way they need to be for the first couple of races this year. Yeah, I think they just need to focus on development these first couple of races after the performance that we saw in um, the first and second races. So they're probably pretty keen just to keep their heads down and do what needs to be done when it comes to bringing those upgrades and figuring out how to solve their porpoising issue and and the rest of it. Um, Hamilton had a great, like he had a pretty good start, I think, um, from memory um, and kind of, kind of got away pretty strongly and he what was it that weird radio message from him like kind of mm. four or five laps to go and he goes you put me in a really difficult position and I just found that an odd thing to say with four laps to go of a race you know what's what is, what is the point of that at this point in time yeah. um you know go and have a conversation with them afterwards if there is something that needs to be discussed but it was just it was just a strange thing to to say, I think at that point in time, but no, I think you're completely right. And Russell kind of, you know, it's a legitimate podium. Um, Sure. Hamilton was definitely faster for the vast majority of the race. Um, But at the end of the day, kind of all comes out in the wash, right? And when you throw a safety car in there or two, who knows what's going to happen. And he was where he needed to be. And we've, we've talked about that in the last couple of weeks, like you said, in terms of saying, you know, you just need to hold that place to potentially take advantage of whatever might happen, like a Red Bull DNF, um, or a a double red, double Red Bull DNF. If you're there and in the fight, you know, and, and stay out of trouble a bit, then, you know, you potentially wrote the the benefits of that. Yeah. It's interesting that this is the mark, we haven't seen this for a long time, this reliability issue that coming mm. out. Uh, it's been a couple of years. So at the moment, it seems that Red Bull really suffering from that 
yeah. uh, and they would want to get it sorted out sooner rather than later. Um, I thought it was interesting. And let's talk now about Red Bull. It was interesting when, uh, of course, Max had the issue, could smell something in the car that was a bit off, so smell some fluid, shut it down, that's fine. Perez, a lap or two later, asked the question, Tommy T, on the radio, what's – and, I mean, I understand Red Bull kind of shutting this down, going, we don't want to tell our competition what the issue is. Yeah. But, you know, if you're in the same car and yeah. you've seen other Red Bull cars and the sister team have an issue over the last couple of weekends, you're going to want to know, like, do I have to do something differently? Yeah. How do I do it? It was – it would be hard to be Sergio in that in that moment. For sure. It's like, well, you're sitting in a plane and they're like, oh, you've got complications. What complications? Like, the wings are still on? Like, are we good? Like <laughs> – <laughs> kind of want to know what's going on here before we take this thing off. Am I about to fall so out of So he's just sitting there driving around at 300 going, kind of want to know what's going on here, guys. Like, yeah. am I driving a bullet now? Like, what's happening? Um, so I understand. But yeah, they, they could have hinted to him in some other way that he would understand with the codes that they have for whatever failures they might have. But um, yeah, Perez was, was solid. He did his job. He managed to put a few good moves on. Um, they probably took longer than he would have liked, but mm. he, he did get them done in the end. And it, it's a good result considering they only had one car for Red Bull. I think they'll be happy considering, but you're so right. That reliability is is going to catch up to them because they are falling back in the constructors because they haven't had cars finish consistently, let alone in finishing in the points. So I think they really need to sort that out sooner or later. Otherwise, they're going to find themselves chasing towards the end of the year and Max now has two. He's really going to have to fight back and win races, not just get points to get back on top of that drivers if that's what he's really after this year. It was a shame for Max Freya, wasn't it? Because he did, he was really on it and we've seen this Charles versus Max now battle for the first couple of races for the season sort of seems to be that's what's going to continue to happen so long as his car continues to work. But this big gap that Charles has built ahead of Max now, not necessarily, well, it's nothing to do with Max, not his fault, it's the reliability issue, but it's circumstances such as these that we've seen in previous seasons where it only takes a couple of those races where you you don't finish due to no fault of your own and, and you were out of shot of a championship by, you know, halfway, three quarters of the way through the season. Max is not going to be best pleased. We know that he says it how it is when uh, it's over on the radio or, or in the garage. They'll be working exceptionally hard between now and Imola to make sure that they sort out these issues. Yeah, he's not going to be happy about this at all. Like it's one thing to for it to be um, driver error as a result of not finishing. It's another to not be able to trust your vehicle um, and to have serious reliability issues, whether it's for one or both cars. And that's the first thing that goes through your head when you see a problem like that. And like how far off is Checo from having the same same thing and it was so close towards the end you're like oh gosh is this going to be um Bahrain all over again um which was which was worrying um and he seemed pretty confident at first that they seemed to have sold because they've had issues all weekend he kind of said no yeah. no, no we've, we've sorted it out but um alas it was not the case um but yeah I'd be nervous if I was them for the next well, <laughs> yeah. yeah the rest of the season really the angry it's Dutchman difficult running if you can't around trust the your campus. car <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, yeah, you're absolutely right. Uh, let's now talk about Ferrari because Carlos signs. Oh, mate. No good <sighs> at all. Frey, Carlos. I want to start with you. I mean, yeah, we all love Carlos. We absolutely do. And it was a heartbreak to see him firstly have the issue in qualifying. His car wouldn't start, which meant he was delayed getting out of the pits uh, to, to put in his, his banker lap and then a good lap. Didn't work out for him. Uh, and it just that was just the theme of his weekend, just yeah. not good luck. The porpoising of that Ferrari, the head movement uh, up and down, the down the back straight into nine and ten, where you got to pick your your braking point to then or your turning point rather to then get through that chicane successfully. Uh, he just misjudged that, which is absolutely fair enough. Um, following on uh, in the car in front of him and tried to turn in. And I would have thought, you know, with the the heritage of Science Senior that we would have seen in a phenomenal drift and just More hold, control. hold it. Uh, but unfortunately, <laughs> lots of grip, lots of downforce. Suddenly you're on the grass with no grip, no downforce. Suddenly back on, you know, tarmac. And then yep. as Martin Brundle said, Frey, once you, you get into the gravel and you spin those rear wheels, the car just sucks itself down onto the, the ground and there's no getting out of it. And you could just feel the disappointment from wherever you were in the world, it wouldn't matter if you're standing right next to him or not. Uh, and it was sad to see, wasn't it? 
oh, it was awful. And then it had to get on that bloody scooter again to get to get out of there. <laughs> yeah. Just, you know, how way to kick a man when he's down. Um, but I think he, like, yeah. he lost five places in the first two laps. Like he did not have a good start. I think quite honestly he was actually lucky not to go kind of full VB Skittle situation. Um and and take out quite a few other drivers when we watched the replay back. It's like that is actually is actually really not good. But yeah, it was not his weekend. It was really unlucky. And of course, as you said, we all love Carlos. So it was um just hard, hard to watch. But yeah, there was some driver error in there, I think, in the race, but a lot of the problems that he's had this weekend are not his fault either. So that's pretty hard to see. But Charles Leclerc, Tommy T, I mean, this is Charles 2.0. Uh he is absolutely sprinting away with this into the summer as fast as he can so long as the sun's in a good spot on his visor and not directly into his face <laughs> the dark but, visor but yeah. he is showing clear pace yep. he built a four and a half second gap pretty quickly and managed to hold that from Verstappen for yep. a big portion of the race I think you can see his hunger is evident in things like him going I want fastest lap as well yes he's not just content with the win he's like yeah. I want to get points and I want to bury everyone now <laughs> and I want to walk away yeah. with this championship before we even get to Brazil. Like I want to seal it before we usually do. Uh, do you know what I mean? Like he's yeah. really got that hunger and he's he's wanting to just bank points, get ahead and just he's ruthless in every qualifying and every kind of like practice session when he's doing a quali sim. Like all these kind of things. He's just, he's just showing that he is dedicated and like fired up and ready to go. But I wanted to talk to you, Freya. So you're, you're the teammate as now Carlos Sainz. What mindset do you have to get into when your teammate is that ruthless and like unbelievable When there's meat perform. on the table. When there's meat on the table, yeah. what does Carlos have to do? What does he have to kind of, what zone does he have to lock into to kind of get the best out of himself and recover the season, I guess? Yeah, it's an interesting question. I think when you look at um, Charles, he's very much out there running his own race. Like he did that on his own today. There was no kind of teammate support and he's out there no. doing his own thing, racing his own race. And that is exactly what Carlos needs to do as well um, in terms of figuring out what those are those issues are um, with his own car. What do I need to do in order to be comfortable in my own setup? Um, and and focus on his strengths as well as a driver because I think the biggest risk in a moment like this is to focus on what somebody else is doing. Um, if you start getting a bit of a lack of confidence in your own, whether it applies to any sport at all, as soon as you start questioning your own training, your own abilities, um, am I actually as fast as they say I am or, or even am I training enough, um, uh, any type of kind of, questioning around your own your own practices there and looking at what other people are doing is it's not a good place to be in. So I think he just needs to kind of put his head down, focus on his own setup and actually and and it sounds a bit counterintuitive because obviously it is a team sport to an extent. Um but the risk here is that he looks too much kind of out of the car what other people are doing rather than yeah. focusing on what he he needs to do to, in order to um to perform in the next couple of races in particular. There's no doubt, is there, that he is a phenomenal driver and certainly worthy of that seat uh, if the luck falls his way in the next couple of races. Of course, he's still not out of contention for that championship uh, and it'll be very interesting to see, of course, if he can match and then reel in what Charles is doing. But certainly yep. the Ferrari, again, looking like the best package on the grid. It's got a great power unit. The consistency is there. The reliability is there. And, of course, Charles is absolutely oh. able to walk away with it. So if Carlos can line that a similar weekend up as well, I think we'll see some good stuff from him as well. Well, that is the team by team analysis as we approach uh, 20 past three in the morning for Freya, who is Oof. absolutely slogging it hard good for, work, on behalf of everyone <laughs> in poor time zones. Let's finish yeah, off, welcome. guys, with F1 Fantasy League and my favorite part, my second favorite part, <laughs> Campy's favorite part, uh, the F1 Fantasy League name competition. Fantasy. Fantasy. 
And uh, we have 149 of you in the competition now. Phenomenal number. Thank you for joining. If you haven't yet joined, uh, it's not too late. It's not about giving prizes out uh, of merch that doesn't yet exist to anyone <laughs> who's won. Uh, it's all about uh, the best team name of the year. We've got a couple of contenders already so far this season, including in here. Um, I'm going to start it off, guys. I'll read down this list. Aussie, 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 GP, 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 which is very hard to say, actually, now that I've said that out loud. Yeah. Daniel B, well done. Anyone need a moped? Joshua A. Stroll loves hook turns. Samuel R. Now, that was... Good reference. That's a very good reference. It's a very specifically <laughs> Melbourne reference. Uh, and if anyone wants to try and explain hook turns in Discord, good luck nope. to you. Fireman Sam and his firefighting scooter, Harrison Z. Uh, McLaren and Campy's top shirt button, both under pressure. <laughs> Craig G. <laughs> Jeez, uh, Tommy is not actually Dutch, Liam C. You want to know who that is? I, I don't know why. He, uh, Liam, Tommy wants to refer you to the stewards. Yeah. Uh, this is I like this. Addy T says, go fund me for Baldwin to buy the shoe decanter because <laughs> I can't afford it still. Sorry, DR. Um, Hulk and back to the subs bench. Josh C. Munus, please name my fantasy team. Zach G. <laughs> Uh, also, Munnis is secretly a lightweight. Nick, yes, well, you know, you were sitting there next to me. Um, Vettel's Vespa Hot Lap, Josh L, Mel Bin, GP, Steen N. We all need the DR decanter, Tara G, Scuderia, Aston Martin. <laughs> That's very good. Uh, yes, Danny Decan, Matt J, Daddy Stroll spending big in Oz, Haley H. Latifi giveth, Latifi taketh away, <laughs> Jacob P. Um, Canada's dynamic duo, Adrian L. And Freya, we'll finish on yours because I love this. Find someone who looks at you like Tommy T looks at F1. And if you don't know what that <laughs> reference good. is, go on to our Instagram <laughs> and have good. a look at one of our reels. It was DR <laughs> driving past and Tommy T pulling the best face. Well, guys, <laughs> that is the Australian Grand Prix in review. A massive thank you to you both, of course, for doing this. And a massive thank you to you for listening, for watching, for supporting the show, for turning up to our drink session on Friday um, and for telling people about this podcast. We absolutely love this growth. We absolutely love your support. And don't forget, we are just fans exactly like you. This is not about us, but we are very, very happy that uh, we form a part of your Formula One consumption over the week. So wherever you are around the world, we hope you have a fantastic week. Freya, a massive, honestly massive thank you for stepping in for Campy. Um, he, Campy is inside a bin, inside a bin, inside a bin, inside a trash compactor. Russian doll of bins. It's just unbelievable. <laughs> there is He's going to be really good layers. friends with Gasly at the end of it though so you know yeah. Ooh, so it's actually not a bad thing but Freya thank you so much for joining us for this review all good and Tommy T lovely to be in person with you thank you for this yes it's it's good to see your face uh, it's not going to be for long though next week on Lakeside Drive we have an interview with Richard Saxby from McLaren Applied Technologies he, he was the head of Mercedes R&D for every single championship year that they were in championships uh, sorry won the championship and also he was at Renault for Fernando Alonso's two championship constructors wins Guy knows as well. some winning I guess Guy yeah. knows some stuff it was an incredible chat uh, can't wait for you to listen to it so make sure you subscribe to the podcast Jump across to the Discord if you want to be stewards for Tommy T's television broadcast <laughs> review. It's a very important role that needs to be filled. Yep. <laughs> uh, but it is time to say goodbye for now. Thank you so much from here in Australia and from the Cayman Islands remotely. Uh, we have a great week and we'll see you next time on Lakeside Drive. Freya, you can now pass out. <laughs> Good work, Freya. I'm sleep for legend. Australia. <laughs> <laughs> You're an absolute legend, mate. Thank you so much. This is the one that hurts. The rest are good. <laughs> yeah. Well, anyway. <laughs> Maybe I have no words left. <laughs> I'm not sure I had anything to say. I've run out of words. <laughs>